Touchstone telephones look like this. It's not a computer. It can't connect to the internet. Can you hack with it? Well, no, not really, but maybe, just maybe, there's one man who can. And this man's name is Kevin Mitnick. And I was in court and I thought I was going home that day. And then this federal prosecutor tells the judge that we not only have to hold Mr. Mitnick without bail, but we have to make sure he can't get to a telephone. Kevin Mitnick. Kevin Mitnick. Kevin Mitnick. Kevin David Mitnick. Kevin Mitnick was arrested twice, first in 1988 and then again in 1995. Both times he was barred from operating both a computer and a telephone because of a danger to national security. The government put him in solitary confinement to prevent all unsupervised communication with the outside world. However, him talking into a telephone was by far not their biggest worry. The real problem was that he would start whistling. And to understand what's wrong with that, we have to go back, all the way back to the 60s. The 60s created many iconic sounds, like this one. I need somebody help, not just and this one. I can't get no. And also, this one. This is the sound of a telephone communicating. It transmits information through frequencies, who calls who, where, and so on. For the old phones, these sounds were the only ways to communicate information about the call to the switchboard. So if you have another way of creating these sounds, you can communicate with the switchboard too. And in this way, you can relay a lot more than just the number you want to call. There was a huge elaborate system of signals used to transfer all kinds of information through the phone lines. Manipulating these frequencies would grant you near absolute control over the system. And the people who harnessed that ability were called freakers. Freakers were the original hackers. They used a huge array of gadgets, tools, and tricks to play with the phone lines for fun and for profit. A Captain Crunch whistle. And if you glue this hole right here, like this, that's 2600. One of the things that we used to do is to go to the, go to the airport, walk along blowing the whistle next to a bank of payphones, <laughs> and disconnect their calls. And as the 70s approached, the phenomenon became endemic. There was this understanding that wherever phone lines reach, freakers can reach too. Schools, hospitals, government institutions, everything was just a call away. You know what else had phone lines? Military bases. And you know what else those bases had? Nukes. The myths about freakers' abilities to connect to the U.S. nuclear arsenal go almost as far as freakers themselves. One of the earliest examples we have comes from 1975. A young freaker named Paul Sheridan boasted to his friend, a police informant, about accessing every phone in the state. According to Paul, he could call the U.S. Air Force bases and order them to scramble the nuclear bombers, and the military would comply. <laughs> Was this true? No, not really. The military used a whole separate phone network from the civilian one, with its own structure and signals, and almost no possibility of reaching it from the outside world. The only part of military communication that could be reached by freakers was Autovan, a special network for non-secure calls, which used the civilian phone lines. By its nature, it was easily accessible, so the military never used it to transmit secret or sensitive information. After breaking into it, the most freakers could do is listen on some trivial chatter and maybe prank a soldier or two. Issuing an order, let alone scrambling bombers through Autovan, was completely impossible. But a myth was born and continued to proliferate. Then came the 80s, and freakers turned into hackers. A lecturer demonstrates not only how to get into a computer, but also how to change things once you're in, like a student's examination result. Well, we use the telephone to dial up the Polytechnic computer and via an acoustic coupler, which just changes the computer signals into sounds so the telephone can handle it. Nuclear bombers were no longer relevant. It was the future. The military used missiles, satellites, and supercomputers. Everything was more connected. And with that, everything seemed more vulnerable to this new, elusive danger. What could be done with these tools? Tapping and overtaking military lines? Breaking into satellites? Launching missiles? The prospect was terrifying. The media loved it. Computer crime has become so sophisticated that the criminal can instruct the computer to fiddle its owner 
and then instruct the computer to forget it did it. Then 1983 came, and with it, the release of War Games. The film catalyzed fears and stereotypes people had about hackers. We're in! And condensed them into a catchy visual form. You have a young hacker who doesn't know what he's doing. What's that mean? I don't know, but it's great. You have the system that can't stop him. And you have the ever-present shadow of total annihilation. The protagonist brought the world to the brink of collapse by accident. So what could a person with actual malicious intent do? There was another element of the puzzle. The setting of a high-tech drama required technology, complicated machines used by freakers and hackers to bend the emerging cyber world to their command. The most popular of these machines were called boxes. They could create frequencies to hack telephone lines. The more complicated boxes you could build, the more successful your freaking would be. But what if you didn't need boxes? What if the phone signals could be created with no tools whatsoever? After all, what we're talking about here are sounds, and human physiology seems perfectly equipped to create them on its own. This is Joe Ingressia, a blind freaker demonstrating the only documented case of using human voice to manipulate phone lines. The phone should be ringing about now. Okay, it hit the phone. Ingressia was also one of the very few freakers to dial into the Autobahn system. The FBI even started investigating his abilities in 1969, but quickly came to the conclusion that he possessed no real danger to national security and dropped the case. Ingressia was only arrested two years later and charged with avoiding payment for long distance calls because that was the extent of the damage he could do while whistling. But that didn't stop the myths. They grew and bloomed. And by the 1990s, they finally gave fruit. Kevin Mitnick was arrested again. Nobody doubted that he was the most powerful hacker in the world. And as such, he combined all the fears people had. Other hackers could whistle to hack through their phones, so Mitnick could too. Other hackers could break into military bases, so Mitnick could too. Other hackers could launch nuclear weapons, so Mitnick could too. And so, when it came time for Mitnick to serve his sentence, the judge was adamant. The man poses a danger like no other. Keeping him in solitary confinement was the only way to prevent the end of the world. So into the hole he went. And the reason they had to keep me away from the phone is I could pick up the phone and I could whistle the launch codes to start a nuclear war. So <laughs> I, I'm serious. So I, mean, I actually laughed in court. So this is how two decades of myths, misconceptions, and sensationalized claims converges onto one man turning his life upside down. So I'm under such stringent conditions of supervised release that if I were to touch this computer, I would probably get sent back to federal prison. After serving his sentence, Mitnick used his fame to become one of the best known names in cybersecurity and devoted a lot of work to breaking the same myths that made several crucial years of his life into such a miserable experience. Unfortunately, a lot of such myths are still around and continue to take a toll on human lives. Here at Cyber News, we try to shed light on them, and you can help us. Subscribe to our channel and share this video with your friends, and we'll keep you updated on all things cybersecurity. See you in the next video.